Southern Gothic is a podcast that explores the history behind some of the American South's darkest days, greatest mysteries, and most chilling ghost stories. Just off the picturesque coast of Georgia, nestled between St. Catharines Sound and Sapelo Sound, is St. Catharines Island. Located about 50 miles south of Savannah, St. Catharines is a part of the long chain of barrier islands off the Atlantic coast, known as the Sea Islands. It stretches approximately 10 miles in length and three miles in width, boasting over 22,000 acres that serve as a diverse tapestry of habitats, including pristine beaches, salt marshes, and serene maritime forests. Today, the island is a safe haven for a number of endangered species, and it is privately owned by a nonprofit whose mission is to protect and conserve this habitat. But one of the things that makes St. Catharines Island so unique is its place in American history as the site of one of the earliest Spanish settlements in North America. A Catholic mission meant to convert the indigenous people who had lived here for almost 5,000 years. Unfortunately, This chapter of St. Catherine's history isn't nearly as peaceful as the island seems today, as the mission that once stood there was the site of a violent rebellion against the Spanish friars who were sent there to spread the Christian faith. Friars who legend claims can still be heard at night singing their antiphonal chants centuries after their death. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. When Spain began colonizing North America, The king's ambitions extended beyond the mere extraction of precious metals like gold and silver. His motives also encompassed economic growth, national empowerment, and the propagation of Catholicism. To achieve these goals, the Spanish established missions wherever they settled. This served a dual purpose. Staffed with Franciscan, Dominican, and Jesuit missionaries, They primarily aimed to convert indigenous populations to Christianity, fostering religious expansion. But by doing this, they also supported the crown's objective to pacify regions that were abundant in valuable natural resources, thereby enabling exploitation by eager investors. This multifaceted approach gave Spain the ability to wield its influence and control over new territories. The first Spanish mission in North America was established in 1565 in St. Augustine, Florida. And over the following years, as Spain claimed more land, the system spread. And by the end of the 16th century, there were over 100 Spanish missions here. Between 1587 and 1680, Mission Santa Catalina de Wale was the northernmost outpost in Spanish Florida, located on St. Catharines Island in what is now Georgia. When the Spanish arrived on the island, it was inhabited by the Wale people, 
a Native American chiefdom of the Mississippian culture. The Wale lived on the coast and sea islands of Georgia, including St. Catherine's Island, for at least 5,000 years. And just recently, in 2022, archaeological research uncovered a 4,000-year-old human gravesite there. The Wale first came into contact with Europeans in 1562, but it wasn't the Spanish. It was French explorers traveling along the Atlantic coast. It's said that they maintained good relations with the short-lived French settlement of Charles Fort on Paris Island in what is now South Carolina. But it wasn't for another few years till the Wale made contact with the Spanish after the settlement of St. Augustine in 1565. And of course, when they did, the Spanish attempted to convert them to Christianity, and the territory of the Wale people became one of the four significant mission provinces of Spanish Florida. By 1587, a group of five or six Franciscan friars ran the mission on St. Catherine's Island, and by all accounts, it seems that the Spanish friars in the Wale lived on the island together peacefully. The friars even learned to speak their language. A church was eventually constructed, and the mission seemed to be a success, as not only did the people there convert to Catholicism, but the mission Santa Catalina de Wale became an important source of labor and food production for larger Spanish Florida settlements like St. Augustine. Unfortunately, the peace did not last for long as resistance to the Christian missionaries began growing over time. In the fall of 1597, a group of Wale men organized by Don Juanillo, or Little John, killed five Franciscan missionaries in what has come to be known as the Wale Rebellion. The unrest began in Mission Tolomato when Juanillo, the heir to the Tolomato chiefdom, wanted a second wife. Friar Pedro de Corpa refused to allow it. After all, Juanillo had been baptized, and according to the friar, he needed to behave as a good Christian man. And if he didn't, well, the friar threatened to stop him from taking his place as chief when his father died. As you can imagine, this didn't sit so well with Don Juanillo. So he set out to gather a force of other like-minded men and began a series of violent assaults on the Spanish missions in the Wale territory. Of course, his first target was Friar Pedro de Corpa. Juanillo decapitated the Franciscan missionary and then put his severed head on a pike that he then placed at Tolomato's boat launch as a warning to others who dare attempt to interfere in his chiefdom. The war party then moved on to other Wale communities and five more friars were killed, two on St. Catherine's Island. These missionaries asked their attackers if they could please celebrate mass before they were killed and they were allowed to do so. And so the warriors sat and watched, patiently waiting to kill them as soon as they finished. The mission Santa Catalina was eventually reestablished, but the hold that the Spanish had on St. Catherine's Island wouldn't last. After the British began to start their own colonies in North America, Santa Catalina became a bit of a barrier between the Spanish and English territories. And as a result, it began to be threatened by other non-Wale native people, many allied with the British. They attempted to raid the island on several occasions, not only for supplies, but also for men to take as slaves. It was on one of these occasions in the 1680s when the Spanish were finally forced to withdraw permanently from St. Catharines. And when they left, the mission Santa Catalina was practically erased and seemingly all traces of its existence and the people who once lived there had disappeared. Of 
course, today, some have claimed to have heard the disembodied sound of antiphonal chants wafting through the air of the Georgia coast at night. Echoes of those Franciscan friars emanating from St. Catherine's Island almost four centuries after the mission was abandoned. In the 1973 book, 13 Georgia Ghosts and Jeffrey, Catherine Tucker Wyndham explores the accounts of Mrs. Courtney Thorpe, who bore witness to the eerie experience in the 1930s. One night, while sitting peacefully on her porch, Mrs. Thorpe found herself immersed in the sound of these spirits. She claimed that the air resonated with a chorus of male voices, captivating her for a solid five minutes before gradually fading into silence. This happened night after night. The haunting melodies stirred memories of the chants that Mrs. Thorpe had once experienced at the esteemed Cathedral of St. John the Baptist in Savannah, leading her to believe that the ethereal singing she heard was none other than the spectral chorus of Santa Catalina Missions, ghostly friars. But even though Mrs. Thorpe had lived on the South Newport River for quite a few years, she wasn't native to the Georgia coast and familiar with their legends. So she nervously asked a friend about it, who, quote, laughed the way people do who discredit the possibility of ghosts, and then replied, Oh, there have been reports of people seeing the ghosts of Catholic missionaries on some of the islands. They were supposed to be the ghosts of the murdered friars. But of course, nobody took the story seriously. At least I didn't. Yet the claims have continued. But what makes St. Catherine's Island so remarkably interesting today is that this now privately owned National Historic Landmark is the site of one of the most important archaeological investigations along the Atlantic coast. We'll discuss more about what happened to St. Catherine's Island following the exit of the Spanish and explore some of the recent archaeological findings after the break. As y'all probably know by now, this world is a strange and mysterious place. And things get even stranger when you consider concepts like that of the imposter entities. Creatures masquerading behind familiar faces to lure you into the dark. Creepy, right? This is one of the many fascinating ideas that I recently heard explored on the Belief Hole podcast. Every other week, the brothers of the Belief Hole present the strangest true stories with corroborative research and immersive storytelling. From documented cases of near-invisible sky creatures that float hidden in the world just above us, to investigating the very founding of the national parks as a clandestine operation to contain unsettling and monstrous phenomena. Y'all, the belief hole is a veritable grab bag of the bazaar. Whether you're hungry for real hauntings or roadside encounters with dogmen, they got you covered. And with their brotherly banter, the guys have a real chemistry and are just weird enough to make you feel like you're laughing in the dark with friends. So y'all join me in listening to the belief hole podcast available on Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. After the fall of the mission Santa Catalina de Wale, St. Catherine's Island became a British territory, and not long after, the land was granted to Mary Musgrove, or Cusaponakisa, a Muscogee Creek woman who played a significant role in the early history of the Georgia colony. In 
Musgrove was the daughter of an English trader and a Creek woman. And as a result, she grew up fluent in both the English and Creek languages. This gave her a unique ability to bridge the gap between the two cultures. And she used her skills to help negotiate peace treaties, trade agreements, and other important matters between the Creeks and the British colonists. Musgrove was also a successful businesswoman and she owned and operated several trading posts. Throughout her life, she was a strong advocate for the Creek people and fought for their rights. Mary Musgrove proudly made St. Catherine's Island her home, and she died there in her house in 1765. The following year, Button Gwinnett, one of the three Georgia signers of the Declaration of Independence, leased the property and lived on the island until his death in 1777, when he died from a fatal wound during a duel. Gwinnett's home is still there today. In the following years, Jacob Waldberg acquired St. Catharines and began to cultivate Sea Island cotton with a large workforce of enslaved Africans. The island was run as a plantation for nearly a century until the Civil War, when in 1865, General Sherman's Special Field Order No. 15 called for the redistribution of confiscated Southern land to freed men in 40-acre plots. So the Federal Freedmen's Bureau appointed an African-American politician named Tunis Campbell to supervise the land claims and resettlement on five of Georgia's sea islands, including St. Catharines. A local government was created, schools were established, and a local militia was even raised to protect this burgeoning African-American community. But in the fall of 1865, President Andrew Johnson revoked Sherman's order and returned most of the land along the South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida coasts back to the white planters who had originally owned it. The federal government then sent black United States soldiers to evict Campbell and the others from St. Catharines, knowing that they wouldn't fire upon other black men. So the island once again served as farm and ranch land. In 1943, John Edward Noble purchased the island. Noble had earned a fortune as the creator of the Candy Lifesavers, and after acquiring St. Catharines, he decided to use it as a ranch for Angus cattle who grazed the fields once used for farming cotton and rice. After Noble passed away in 1958, the island's ownership was transferred to the Edward J. Noble Foundation, who in turn worked with the Wildlife Conservation Society to turn part of St. Catharines into a research and breeding station for endangered animals, a last resort for species on the brink of extinction. Today, this work continues, and it is privately owned by the St. Catharines Island Foundation, its interior preserved for charitable, scientific, and educational purposes. Over the years, a wide array of animals could be found on St. Catharines, from cattle to kangaroos, but today it is most notably home to several exotic animal species, including Asian hornbill birds, antelopes, zebras, and ring-tailed lemurs. In fact, St. Catharines is the only place in the world, aside from Madagascar, where lemurs roam freely. Of course, this isn't the only type of work being done there. After all, it was once home to an integral part of the European settlement of North America. So as you can expect, archaeologists have been working on St. Catharines for decades. David Hurst Thomas, the curator of North American archaeology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, found the lost mission in 1986 after over a decade of searching. What they found was a mission that was carefully laid out and constructed on a planned town grid. They uncovered the remains of a church, friar's quarters, a kitchen, wells, a churchyard, and part of a Wale settlement that had been attached to the mission itself. 
Within the church was a cemetery, or Campo Santo, the location of which was not entirely surprising, as Franciscan customs dictated that the mission cemeteries be placed with the church. It was there, in this cemetery, that the remains of more than 400 people were found to have been laid to rest. Yet what was truly surprising was the quantity and quality of grave goods that had been interred with the dead, including crosses, Franciscan medallions, Jesuit finger rings, a cast figurine of the infant Jesus, and other religious and utilitarian objects. Franciscan funerary custom did not traditionally permit the inclusion of grave goods for burials, viewing the practice as a, quote, heathen custom. But what we know from the excavation of pre-Christian burial mounds is that the Wale people did practice the tradition of interring grave goods. So this was a truly interesting discovery to see that the Spanish friars allowed the Wale to continue to maintain at least some of their traditions, even when they might have contradicted their own. The unearthed remains also indicated that there were two stages of Spanish mission occupation on St. Catharines. The first was from 1587 to 1597, whose end came with the Juanillo Uprising. And the second stage was from 1604 to about 1650, when the British forced the Spanish to flee southward. They also confirmed another important discovery, that Spanish missions existed in Georgia nearly two centuries before they did in California. And Santa Catalina was in fact the first planned Spanish settlement in the state. Yet this wasn't even the most important discovery, as the archaeologists found evidence that entirely changed the traditional narrative that's been told about life in Spanish colonial North America. Previously, folks saw the colony as a generally poor one, both figuratively and literally, identifying Florida as one of the most impoverished outposts of colonial Spain. European colonists of places like St. Augustine characterized it as one of ruin and neglect. But the discoveries found on St. Catherine's Island contradicts this. Among the artifacts found were incredibly valuable items like gold and silver medallions and more than 65,000 glass beads, a currency that arrived in North America with the Europeans. These beads would have been imported by the Spanish from Europe, China, and India, and the presence of them in such vast quantities proved that the folks at the small mission outpost were not only extremely well off, but also a part of the global exchange of goods. But the island wasn't just wealthy monetarily. Examination of the mission trash heaps showed evidence that the island did not lack meat or seafood. In fact, it's likely that when the governor of St. Augustine feasted with the friars in the Wale at the Mission Santa Catalina, he may well have feasted on the best meal he had had since he got to North America. This higher standard of living discovered on St. Catharines, compared to the capital of St. Augustine, showed the relationship that the Spanish had with the indigenous people was much more complex than previously thought. As to the Wale Rebellion, primary sources indicated that the root cause of the uprising had less to do with overthrowing and expelling the Catholic missions, and more to do with the alliances that they held with the different indigenous chiefdoms in present-day Georgia. The tribes used their own alliances with the varying European colonists to gain power, position, and territory within themselves. Historians J. Michael Francis and Kathleen Cole published a study on the Juanillo Rebellion's causes called Murder and Martyrdom in Spanish Florida. It confirmed this new belief through the examination of primary source material. It seems that despite the perception of European supremacy, the reality was that the indigenous tribes held significant power over the Spanish at this point in time, and that if the Spanish had any hope to maintain their North American colonies, they needed to ally with the indigenous people, relying heavily on tribes like the Wale for both food and protection from the British. And how
how exactly did the Spanish do this? The use of diplomatic gifts, like European glass beads. While archaeologists continue to work on St. Catherine's Island, over the years they have uncovered more than two million artifacts. And today, 12 palm trees mark the spot where the mission compound once stood. A reminder of the friars who once lived there alongside the Wale people. Friars who might just still be singing their antiphonal chants to this very day. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independent podcast produced by siblings Brianne and Brandon Schecksneider. If you're a fan of the show and would like more content, be sure to join us over on Patreon or become a premium subscriber on the Apple Podcast app. There, you'll receive access to both ad-free and monthly bonus episodes. This show is also a member of Airwave Media, a podcast network that features some of the leading storytellers in audio entertainment, including other chart-topping podcasts like Redacted History and Historical Blindness. For more info on Southern Gothic, be sure to visit southerngothicmedia.com today. And as always, thanks for listening. Lucky Little Shacks.